But it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Matt Kearney, who we've also we've already heard from this morning, as you know, <coughs> National Clinical Director for CVD Prevention, Prevention at NHS England and Public Health England. And he's going to talk to us about high-risk conditions for CVD, the high-impact preven prevention in the NHS. On your marks, get set. So, <laughs> our mission, keeping the heart and brain happy. In my six minutes, I will talk about why CVD prevention, why the focus on the high-risk conditions, and why we have to do things differently, what the long-term plan will help us to do and how much difference it will make, how many lives can be saved or transformed by doing CVD prevention in the NHS better. Now, Petra Kutcher is about the art of communication. For some people, a visual image is the way through to their heart and brain. Sometimes it's words, Slade, that have the bigger impact. And sometimes it's numbers. The 20 billion pounds the NHS has just been given, or the 20 million that Josie Mourinho was paid to leave Old Trafford after being rolled over by Liverpool. So, why the focus on cardiovascular disease? Well, we all know the story. Heart attacks and strokes affect 7 million people and cost the NHS 7 billion pounds a year. Responsible for one in four deaths and a big contributor to health inequalities, accounting for a quarter of the life expectancy gap between rich and poor. But CVD is also very preventable. Modifying lifestyle, of course, is key. But modifying the physiological risks has a huge impact. So the Global Burden of Disease study showed the leading causes of death and disability in England. Predictably, smoking is number one. But just look at blood pressure and cholesterol. Taken together, the harm they cause is as great as smoking. Now, we still hear from patients and the media that someone's heart attack or stroke came out of the blue. And this was famously captured after President Roosevelt's uh, stroke shortly after the war. But of course, if we look at his blood pressure from the 1930s, we can see this event was both predictable and preventable. Now, we think the NHS gets prevention. Certainly, we've got a lot better at understanding and articulating that prevention is better than cure, that good health needs much more than medical treatment. We now all easily embrace the, uh, the Dahlgren and Whitehead rainbow that you'll recognise that captures the importance of the wider social determinants of health. But at the same time, primary care is oddly resistant to prevention. So when we propose interventions on physical activity, the health check, the heart age test, there's often vocal challenge. No evidence, you're medicalising health, uh, it's the government's job. Of course, legitimate questions, but perhaps more of a fig leaf that distracts from the things we in the NHS could be doing a lot better. So why the resistance? Well, because general practice is now busy to breaking point, and we're not coping. We're afraid of making mistakes and missing diagnoses. GPs are retiring early, we can't recruit to vacancies. So even with well-intentioned ideas, we say, so what do you want me to stop doing if I start doing that? This is human nature, and I'm sure we would all do the same. So if we want to get serious about prevention of CVD, let's tell a story that strikes a chord in primary care. Let's focus on the high-risk conditions that make up our day job. Blood pressure, AF, cholesterol, common conditions that we manage in primary care, and look how much interventions reduce the risk. So how are we doing for our patients? On average, the rule of halves applies in high blood pressure, um, around 60% of diagnosed and 60% of them are treated to target. In people with known AF, only half have been anticoagulated before they stroke. And with CVD risk above 20%, 20 you've got a one in three chance of getting on statins. Of course, it's not the same everywhere. And health inequalities plays out in the diagnosis and management of the high-risk conditions. The top graph shows your chance of good blood pressure control varies from 80% down to 40%, depending on your practice. And for AF strokes, we see extraordinary variation in anticoagulation rates between CCGs from 100% just to down 20%. How much does it matter? Well, the Commonwealth Fund report shows how the UK performs in healthcare compared to other countries. And as you'd expect, we do well overall, particularly in access, equity, and efficiency. But in health outcomes, look, we're second to last, second only to the US, and much of that is because of our poor performance in cardiovascular disease. So why are we not doing better in the high-risk conditions? because what sounds simple is actually quite hard to do in modern general practice. The high-risk conditions often have no symptoms to sound the alarm in consultations. And consultations are highly pressured. Most patients have multiple conditions with competing priorities. Not all of these will get addressed in 10-minute consultation. So we won't resolve this by getting GPs to run faster or go on more courses. The barriers are structural and substantial. That's why the rule of halves has changed so little in 30 years and is entrenched. 
If we're to improve outcomes for our populations, we have to do things differently with new models and pathways through primary care. So what's the essential learning from case studies? How do you address the structural challenges to diagnosis and treatment? Four critical factors for success stand out to me. Real-time data. Oh, I'm sorry, I have gone wrong. Excellent. Well, that's to show you some fantastic um, case studies <laughs> around the country. Um, picture, postcard Britain. And what can we learn from these case studies I've just told you about? How do you address the structural challenges? The four critical risk factors that stand out, real-time data shared across practices, clinical leadership, new pathways using the wider primary care workforce, and a relentless focus on the size of the prize. And the long-term plan articulated the size of the prize, preventing 150,000 heart attacks and strokes. There are substantial commitments in there on primary prevention, obesity, smoking, um, alcohol, of course. But to improve care in the high-risk conditions, the new primary care networks with expanded teams and accountability for population health will allow us to do things differently. This and the new GP contract is a new landscape that will help to make this happen. Primary care networks supported by right care and a range of partners, real-time data, mobilising the community and the wider workforce to find the undiagnosed and treat the undertreated. Working together and working differently will help to prevent heart attacks and strokes at scale. The plan also announced CVD Prevent, which I may have mentioned this morning, a national primary care audit showing at practice and network level how well we're performing in detection and management of the high risk conditions. This will provide a wealth of real-time data that will be key to driving professionally-led quality improvement. So what does this all add up to? To thousands of heart attacks and strokes prevented over 10 years to a set of huge numbers that will transform lives, to thousands of people and their families who will not have heart attacks and strokes. This is CVD prevention at scale in the NHS, and between us, we're going to make this happen. Thank you.